Welcome back. So we're nearly done with this kind of intro short boot camp on physics and form machine learning. And I thought it would be nice to show you where this is going. So this is uh, designed to be the intro, let's say four or five hours of a larger course on physics and form machine learning, where you can kind of pick and choose different topics uh, as you find interesting. Um, so the first kind of next deep dive section, so I'm going to lay out a bunch of uh, kind of next modules that we're uh, going to, to dive into. And these will range anywhere from, you know, one hour to 10 hours, but let's say kind of ballpark four to five hours is kind of what I'm targeting. Uh, so the first one in this physics and form machine learning uh, larger course would be a little module on parsimonious models. How do you take data and with machine learning discover differential equations that are interpretable and generalizable using the techniques we're talking about? Different architectures, loss functions, optimization algorithms. How do you make these models more physical if you apply them to things like mechanical mechanical systems or fluid systems. Another module we're going to talk about are PINs, Physics Informed Neural Networks. This is one of the most popular uh, and kind of widely used types of physics informed machine learning algorithm. So we're going to talk about you know, how these are designed, how to train them, when they work, when they don't, um, you know, what are all the variants. There's a ton of different types of PINs. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this because I've been meaning to you know, dive deeper into the literature and learn more about it myself. Uh, and kind of related are these operator methods, um, things like Fourier neural operators, deep O nets, neural implicit flow. Lots of um, physics informed machine learning algorithms are really trying to get to uh, learning these operators, these solution operators of differential equations. So we'll, we'll definitely uh, spend a decent amount of time here in operator methods. Um, this one is pretty, pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, we'll have a whole module, kind of a, a deep dive on symmetry. This might end up evolving into its own full course uh, if I have enough time and uh, you know uh, enough time to do you know uh, some more some more lectures. And I also want to get some uh, other folks to help out with this who are really you know some of the world's leading experts in symmetry uh, and machine learning. Actually, my like first lab. I ever worked in when I was an undergrad um, at Caltech uh, was with Jerry Marsden. And Jerry was one of the pioneers in kind of understanding symmetries in uh, physical systems, in mathematical modeling, computational modeling. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of those ideas that were developed um, in the kind of computational and analytical. Uh, physics era are now equally or more relevant in the machine learning era. So a lot about symmetries really um, makes a big difference in machine learning algorithms. Uh, and again, this is kind of uh, exciting for me because this is stuff I, you know, really fell in love with 20 years ago. So it's kind of fun to get a chance to, you know, bring this back to life. Um, digital twins is a really, really important topic in uh, engineering, design, optimization in general. And machine learning models that are physical play a central role in the digital twin uh, kind of framework. So reduced order modeling, discovering models from data, making sure those models have physics and you know symmetries and respect the physics are really, really critical um, to the digital twin kind of revolution of how we're going to design uh, and optimize complex engineering systems in the future. So again, this will be, you know, ideally at least five hours, but it could easily be 10 hours or even a whole course, depending on, you know, uh, how ambitious we are. Uh, and then the last piece of this, and I think there will be other pieces that I'm not mentioning here. These are just the six that I'm definitely planning right now, will be case studies and benchmarks. So we're going to spend a decent amount of time digging into actual physical examples like fluid mechanics, materials discovery, robotics, um, 
you know, and how do you do parsimonious modeling or pins or, you know, what are the symmetries? How do digital twins impact those fields? We're going to dig into case studies in particular engineering areas of relevance. And this won't just be me. I'm hoping to, you know, get lots of my uh, expert colleagues who have great case studies to contribute uh, to this. So that'll be somewhere between kind of educational and research level. Uh, and along with case studies, there are benchmarks. We have this critical need for benchmark problems um, to test these physics and form machine learning algorithms. And so also have like a good chunk of time dedicated to going through what benchmarks exist in the literature, which ones are good for which types of problems, what do we need you know, five years from now in a benchmark problem. So that'll also be in that kind of case studies and benchmark uh, topic. So each of these are going to be kind of deep dive modules, um, some longer, some shorter, some might be an entire course, you know, eventually, that really get to this idea of how do you use some of these ideas in physics and foreign machine learning in, you know, actual engineering, actual scientific discovery, actual design and optimization. So it was super exciting um, for me, like a lot of this is stuff that I either, you know, used to like or do a lot of research in or want to learn more about. So I, you know, hope this is really exciting for, for you as well. Okay, good. Um, so again, the overarching framework for this physics informed machine learning curriculum is based around this idea that machine learning is not magic. Um, it's just the process of building models from data using optimization. And there's some, you know, standard stages that go into building a machine learning process, a machine learning model, and you can embed physics in each of those stages. Sometimes you can embed physics in multiple stages, um, as we've seen in the past. And so, again, those modules are really going to dig into different aspects of this. So when we talk about pins, you know, we're really primarily talking about crafting a loss function. When we talk about operator networks, maybe we're getting more into the architecture um, design and things like that. Um, you know, but all of these are going to have some element. Uh, most of them are going to have multiple elements in this, this uh, machine learning modeling process. Good. Uh, and again, when I'm talking about physics informed machine learning, we are mostly talking about these two dual problems of baking in or enforcing partially known physics or known physics into machine learning algorithms. So if I know uh, physics, and that could mean a lot of things, maybe I know a partial differential equation, maybe I know a conservation law, maybe I know a symmetry or an invariant that my system has, then we can enforce that or promote that in our machine learning models and often uh, get better models with less data. And often those models will generalize better, which is really important when we're doing engineering design. If I want to design a new wing that's different than any wing I've ever seen before, I hope, and if I want to use machine learning in that process, I hope that those models generalize better and incorporate the known physics we know about, you know, fluid dynamics and things like that. And then the dual side is oftentimes we're able to discover new physics for even more complex systems that we haven't been able to write down, you know, F equals MA type physics. Maybe we can discover new physics given our wealth of measurement data and these emerging machine learning tools. So systems like neuroscience and, you know, human metabolism, like all kinds of examples where it's hard to write down governing physical equations and laws. Maybe we can start discovering them with machine learning. OK, um, and again, we'll look at case studies and benchmark problems and all kinds of things that are really, you know, focused on this kind of uh, dual enforcing and discovering uh, paradigm. A lot of this uh, discussion is, you know, related to chapters in this book, uh, Data Driven Science and Engineering by myself and Nathan Kutz. Not all of it, some of it will be in other lecture notes, um, you know, and as those lecture notes get written, I'll put links in the description. Um, but, you know, this is a good starting place if you're interested in, you know, getting started with, with some of these methods. A lot of the mathematical foundations are, are in this book. Um, okay, so that's, you know, the, the mile high overview of things we're about to see. These are all going to be deep dive modules and I'll just, you know, maybe, uh, give like one slide each on these cause I, you know, think it's interesting and I'll give you a little bit more of a sneak preview. You can always, you know, stop watching now and just go into these modules. Um, but I wanted to go a little deeper. 
So the parsimonious modeling and model discovery, what I really mean is that most dynamical systems, most systems that change in time, um, here this is a fluid, but you know, brains, uh, financial markets, uh, the climate, epidemiology, pretty much any complex system that you can think of uh, evolves in time according to either ordinary or partial differential equations. Now they might be high dimensional, they might be stochastic, they might be nonlinear. There's all these like elements of, of differential equations that capture the richness uh, of the changing world around us. But the module on parsimonious model, on dynamical systems model, modeling, is really focused on how do you use this increasing wealth of data, measurement data from systems, and machine learning algorithms to learn differential equations uh, purely from data. Super exciting area. Imagine you know, if you had the planetary motion, um, you, know, you had tables or data from the motion of the planets. Could you learn Kepler's law? Could you learn F equals MA? Could you learn the correction, Einstein's correction, because of the discrepancies in the transit of Mercury? These are the kinds of you know, questions we can answer with data and machine learning now. And then we can apply those principles to new problems where nobody knows the answer. You know, can we model plasma systems or granular material or neuroscience? Can you build a model for the brain um, you know, from the measurement data? Super exciting topic. Okay, um, we already mentioned a whole module on pins. This idea that um, in addition to the, the kind of standard neural network loss function you would use to train a neural network, if you know that your neural network is trying to uh, predict or reconstruct a physical field, like a fluid velocity field or some other you know, physical spatial field, a field that varies in space and time, if you know that that field is governed by physics, by a partial differential equation, you can often add another custom loss function that captures and encapsulates that physics uh, in the training process. And there's a ton of benefits to this. Um, it's really easy to add that physics-informed loss. Um, it allows you to train oftentimes with less data um, and kind of really cool things. Like let's say I have a, a fusion reactor and I can only take point measurements on the surface of this fusion reactor because if I put them inside they'll melt or they'll disrupt the, the plasma. If I have those measurements and I know the partial differential equation that governs that system, I can have the, these kind of two loss functions and I can do a much better job of filling in what the plasma field, what the velocity field um, and electromagnetic field are even away from my measurements. So really cool stuff you can do with pins. And again, we're gonna dive into a lot of the modern types of pins and flavors, and hopefully actually do some case studies and code this up and you know, look at examples. Um, you know, another topic, again, I mentioned this briefly, are things like operator networks. Um, so neural networks are often viewed in the lens that they are universal function approximators, meaning that you can approximate kind of arbitrarily well, you know, any generic function with a big enough neural network and enough training data. And there's this notion that uh, instead of just modeling a function, an input-output function, neural networks can also model operators that operate on functions. So the solution of a differential equation is an operator that might operate on an initial condition or a boundary condition. And so that's the idea here, is that you can often use uh, deep learning to learn these solution operators for pretty complicated physics. So this is a deep O-net, a deep operator network architecture. This is a Fourier neural operator. And we're going to start getting into you know, how these work. Do they work you know, for interpolation? Uh, do they fail for extrapolation? How much training data do they need? You know, what are generalizations and extensions and things like that? But I expect that we're going to see an increase in operator methods you know in the next five or ten years so I want you to know kind of um, what the standard ones are doing and how they work uh, and symmetries again I mentioned um, you know symmetries are such a fundamental part of how we encode physics in the real world and so they are an incredibly important way to uh, guide or bias or constrain your machine learning model to be more physical. So we'll talk a lot about symmetries. Um, this is a, just a diagram that 
captures this notion called equivariance that you know if i have a neural network f that maps you know some data x to some data y then that network is equivariant with respect to some symmetry group g if it doesn't matter if you apply g first and then f or if you apply f first and then g it's a very mathematical concept, but it also has super physical meaning, like translational invariance. If my model should be invariant to translations or rotations, that fits into this mathematical framework for very specific types of symmetry groups, G. Okay, so we'll dive into this, um, and it's super interesting math. There's manifold theory and Lie groups and uh, just really, really beautiful math. And it also, a lot of, um, the history of math and mathematical physics is really built around symmetries. So, you know, Einstein thought a ton about symmetries. Uh, Emmy Noether gave us this uh, incredible, um, you know, theorem about symmetries and invariances and reduction that we can use today uh, in machine learning. Uh, and digital twins, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road in at least engineering design, is how do you build models of models? Uh, some of those models might be physics-based, some of those models are machine learning, some are hybrid. And how do you update those models with new data? How do you use those models to design and optimize uh, new engineering systems? How do you build in active learning and uncertainty quantification into those models so that you can tell if your twin you know, is, should be agreeing with your physical asset or if it might be you know, disagreeing? So this is a um, you know, really, really important topic in how you apply machine learning to, to engineering systems. And again, if we're applying machine learning to engineering systems like designing an aircraft, I sure hope that physics is built into those machine learning models. I, if I'm gonna get on, you know, uh, in an automobile that was designed with machine learning, I want those machine learning models to have our best knowledge of the physics, um, you know, when, when we're designing them. Uh, and again, it gives us a lot of ideas on how you can take multi-fidelity data. Again, we're, we're talking about how do you actually do design and engineering in the real world where you have multi-fidelity data, and how do you build these surrogate models that you can optimize over? And how do you get the best of both worlds of all of these different data sources in terms of you know, lower cost and lower error, which should allow us as engineers to have uh, faster design cycles, lower cost design cycles, you know, design actual better uh, materials and rocket ships and wind turbines and aircraft, um, you know, for cheaper. And so it's a, really exciting. This is gonna change how we do engineering and a lot of it's built on this physics informed machine learning. Uh, and then a case, um, of course, I want to go into depth in case studies. I want you not just to get the kind of theory of symmetries and the theory of pins. I want us to see how this actually changes for a robotic system or for a material system or a fluid system or a manufacturing system. So we're going to look at case studies throughout about um, kind of how these um, different approaches matter? What are the subtleties and the subtle differences in the data types and qualities and quantity? What, are the, what do I mean by physics in these different scenarios? Um, you know, which ones are appropriate for digital twin modeling and which ones aren't? And along the same lines, we're gonna be looking at benchmark systems along the way to test these different algorithms and see how they work. Um, okay, so that is the sneak peak of this kind of larger class on physics and form machine learning. We just finished the intro module, the overview module, and now, you know, hopefully soon there are going to be these deep dive modules and short courses on these super interesting topics. Probably there will be more than this. Um, you know, I hope so. These are the ones that kind of, you know, are already in the works uh, and being planned. All right, I'm super excited to walk through this with you and to learn a lot of this with you. Uh, I hope you're excited too. So uh, yeah, thank you and I'll see you soon.